Visit www.comein.ws today. Train at home for a new career in healthcare. Take advantage of affordable tuition, short completion timelines, and graduate assistance. Over 65,000 students have chosen us for these benefits and many more. Our school's commitment to quality ensures that graduates have the skills they need to succeed in their new career. Our courses include medical transcription and editing, medical coding and billing, pharmacy technician with Walgreens and CVS externships available, computer technician, medical administrative assisting, medical billing, administrative assisting, and more. Our programs are all approved for MyCAA funding, which can completely cover the costs for eligible military spouses. Students in the Canadian provinces of British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec can also enroll in select programs. Learn more. Visit www.comein.ws today. That's www.comein.ws. Visit today. in the Middle East, our candidates a one-world government and one-world religious system. Will America be attacked again? Do ancient prophetic texts warn of the times we are living in? Are we in the last days? The time of Jacob's trouble, the end of the world as we know it? And what of the increase of UFO sightings? While we may disagree as what is causing the phenomena, we can agree that it is real burgeoning and not going away. Is this the coming great deception that ancient prophecy warned us about? Does time seem to be accelerating? Join me, your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli, as we explore these and other riveting, stimulating topics. This is Acceleration Radio. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is L.A. Marzulli. We're actually pre-recording uh, this on Monday morning, so it's really morning here, but we're going to pretend it's the evening, and it's on Thursday night. Our producer, Rick, is going away, and uh, so this is a pre-record with our special guest, Bill Salas. We'll be discussing his new book, Psalm 83, The Missing Prophecy Revealed. Um, can't wait to get into that with Bill, and we'll bring him on in a little bit. Um, for those of you who have been following the blog or the radio show for any length of time, you know, first of all, that uh, I am been looking and and i'm trying to do two things at once that's why i'm stuttering here hold on let me turn off the iphone so we don't get any unwanted calls on that middle of the show um you'll know that i've been following the king of jordan for for quite some time i've written ex exclusively about it i keep an eye on him when any new developments happens i let everyone know um there's a whole uh part in the book the cosmic chess match which discusses what i call the luciferian and dialectic a dialectic of course uh, is comprised of three components. The first is uh, thesis, the second is antithesis, the third is synthesis, or conflict, counter-conflict synthesis, Much maybe a slightly way easier way of looking at it. The conflict, of course, in the Luciferian dialectic, I've talked about this before, but just a, a brief overview here, is the 9-11 events. doesn't matter who did it, who cares? Um, and, and the more I look at this, the more I... Um, explore it and i don't believe that planes brought down those buildings i think we're looking at perhaps a, a scalar technology uh, a weapon which we have no idea which actually turns metal and concrete literally into dust um, if you're interested in that uh, there are some very interesting uh, youtube videos you can go check out um, i don't have that don't ever name offhand and i apologize for that remember this is pre-recorded so don't start writing me it's this person i just can't think of her name she posted a, about a two-hour presentation lecture period and uh, she's been of course dragged by the media but when you actually look at the slow-mo of uh, building uh, the twin towers coming down we see that they are literally turning to dust uh, before they hit the ground it's just it's, it, and things don't metal and concrete don't do that folks Got a problem with that. Metal and concrete don't do it. So anyway, that's, but I digress. So the conflict anyway is we we have 9-11 events. The counter-conflict to that, of course, is we go into Afghanistan and you know, we try to get al-Qaeda and all this other nonsense. But, and then I, I, I really go down a rabbit trail here with the whole Bin Laden thing. But again, I won't because I'm trying to get the, the point here. But <laughs> so it's, 
Head spinning here, folks. Then we go into Iraq for some bizarre reason, and this is where the King of Jordan comes into play. This is where the Luciferian dialectic, in my opinion, and of course this is what I want to talk about, because in the Debka file this morning on April 1st, and this is not an April Fool joke, because you're hearing this on Thursday, Palestinians kick off Jerusalem bid by ceding holy sites custodianship to Jordan's king. Hello? What's going on with that, folks? What can I tell you? So here's the deal. We, we know we went into Iraq, and Iraq is continually uh, embroiled in what I would call sectarian violence, uh, Shia against Sunni. There's a suicide bomber, bomber that blows himself up oh, once every 5 to 15 days, somewhere in that window, kaboom, somebody else, you know, like, like a Magad terrorist, uh, Jeff Dunham, I kill you, was the same exact thing. And it's, not, it's really not a laughing matter, and Iraq is not a safe place, even in, in Baghdad. But when the Iraqis were drawing up their constitution, the King Abdullah II offered to set up a constitutional monarchy in Iraq. All this is documented in the book, The Cosmic Chess Match. Very lengthy article there. Um, and and it, it's, it's, that's why I included it, because I think it's important that we keep an eye on this guy. He's a player. So we already know that King Abdullah II... Uh, oh, and by the way, the Iraqis refused a constitutional monarchy. So the other thing here is that Jordan is populated by about 75% what is known as Palestinians, even though there's no such thing as Palestinians, that uh, when uh, people from the West Bank and everything else, but that's they call themselves Palestinians, that's what they are. Also in that book, and I do this on presentations, uh, we also talk about that. Uh, the King of Jordan and, and other heads of state of Jordan and, and princes of Jordan and, and monarchy of Jordan all have looked at the pal Palestinians and the Jordanians as one and the same people. And I've got direct quotes on that. So what's happening here, what may be happening, and this, of course, would be the third leg of a dialectic. And if that really happens and we're looking at something which is obviously has a supernatural component to it, that's the whole point. So here's here's what may be happening. We know that King Abdullah already has control of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The Waqf controls that. And the Waqf, W-A-Q-F, answers to the King of Jordan. But listen to this Listen to this article. Let me bump this up a little bit. The historic agreement signed in Amman, Sunday, March 31st, so that's just a few days ago, between Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas and Jordan's King Abdullah II takes a new stand on Jerusalem. One of the core issues subject to negotiation with Israel by accepting the king as custodian of the city's holy sites. The Palestinians agree that Abdullah will oversee and manage the Waqf. The Waqf, W-A-Q-F, is the Muslim religious authority in Jerusalem and represents the interests of the holy sites in relevant international forums through, um, through feasible legal means. Where the Palestinians, Wafa, and Jordanian Petra versions of the same agreement differ is over the definition of Palestinian sovereignty. And, it, and the article goes on from there. Of course, what I just find absolutely incredible is that, once again, we see that the King of Jordan is in play here. He is a definite player in the Middle East. So the third layer of a dialectic would be this. What if the King of Da, uh, after maybe the Psalm 83 war, this is why I'm bringing this up, folks, because we are on the verge of this, and this is why it's so cool to have uh, my friend and, and colleague Bill Salas here because it will be answering some of these questions. But if, if the Palestinian war really erupts, let's say, war in the Middle East erupts, and it's, it's that 60-year-old conundrum, basically, the, the, the two-state solution, and, of course, the Israelis constantly give land for peace like they did in Gaza, and what do we see? We see the Israelis give, uh, Israelis give land, but there is no peace. There you have it, folks. No peace. They give a land, and there is no peace. In fact, when they were withdrawing from Gaza, the rockets began. So Jerusalem truly has become a cup of trembling, just like Jesus warns us of. And for those of you out there who think I'm heretical, and there's a few, and you know who I'm talking about, by believing that these Jews are really not the Jews, then if they're not, if they're not the Jews, then I guess God has made a mistake. We need to get them all out of Israel and start over again. It is absolutely an absurd, anti-Semitic position, and there are people that are blasting myself and other people who hold that Israel has been regathered back from the four corners of the earth. Yes, folks, anti-Semitism is on the rise, just like before World War II, and it's really easy to tell who your friends are. Those who support Israel and understand uh, the threat of prophecy from the book of uh, Genesis to Revelation understand that these are, in fact, God's chosen people, and that Hitler had no problem distinguishing the Jews uh, and, and basically wiped out six million of them. So many of those 
the remnants of those Jews fled back to Israel. And of course, this is where we get into the uh, the anti-Semitic rants, and I'm not going to mention any names, but they know who they are, and frankly, you know who they are. And I would just suggest you to stay clear of these people because they are filled with hate, and they uh, they don't even want to pray. They just they don't want me to pray for them. And uh, they won't pray for me. But guess what, folks? I pray for them, that God would open up their eyes. Because unless we understand Israel, there's no idea. We have no idea what the prophetic landscape really holds. And like Savonarola, who grounded a people and, and, the, and the Jesuits of the Inquisition, um, these people don't engage in auto de fe's per se, but they've got the Internet, folks, and they blast away at people like myself and my other colleagues, like Bill, uh, Bill Salas, I'm sure, has been hit, Doug Hamp, Doug Woodward, and others who hold Israel uh, as the fulfillment, partial fulfillment of Ezekiel 37. But I digress. Um, moving on with the topic, what we see here is that King, the King Abdullah of Jordan has the, the power Literally, what if he abdicated and allowed the Palestinians to set up a their own government, their own nation uh, in Palestine, or, or let's put it this way, in Jordan? So what if Jordan became the Palestinian homeland? They, they could call it whatever they wanted to, right, Palestine. So what if that happens? What if, what if um, uh, the king of Jordan would do that? Well, the next thing we know is that King Abdullah the second of, of Jordan also controls the Temple Mounts in Jerusalem. That being the case, what if, it's a huge what if, but what if King Abdullah uh, sort of threw up to the Israelis as, as a peace offering, that the Israelis would be allowed to construct a wall between the Dome of the Rock and the unused portion of a temple mount. Remember, the temple mount is 40 acres. They don't need to take, take the Dome of the Rock out. They could put up a wall and build the temple right there. What if he allows them to do that? Then, my friends, we have seen a Luciferian dialectic, especially if the king of Jordan goes to Iraq and sets up his constitutional monarchy. Why would the king of Jordan even offer the Iraqis to set up a constitutional monarchy? Remember, the king of Jordan is a Hashemite king, Hashem is the uncle of Muhammad. The king of Jordan holds great sway in the Arab world, both Shia and Sunni Muslims. Uh, pay him due respect because he is a direct descendant, and he's already done this when the Iraqis were setting up their constitutional or constitution uh, several years back. So this is not unprecedented, folks. He's already offered it once, and Iraq needs a strong man. Enter the king, and of course, the king would not build his his uh, his or let's put it this way, resurrect. Uh, let, let me back up. The king would not use Baghdad as his capital. He would resurrect the ancient city of Babylon. So these are things to consider. This is why I watch this stuff like a hawk. And, you know, I don't talk about it unless something happens. And bang, something just happened. Palestinians kick off Jerusalem bid by ceding holy sites custodianship to Jordan's king, Abdullah. That's in the Debka file. Uh, if you want to, you can go to D-E-B-K-A, Debka file, Debka.com, Debka.com, and scrounge around for that. I may actually blog on this tomorrow. Uh, this is Tuesday, uh, or tomorrow will be Tuesday. Uh, this gets really confusing because you're hearing us on Thursday, so you'll have to go back to Tuesday. Uh, today is Monday, and I've left the Easter musical up because I know a lot of people don't visit the blog on the weekend, and, and what the heck, it's... Uh, that's the good news. That's the hope that he rose again, rose up from the dead, and he has risen. And as the ancient church used to say, the early church, I should say, as the early church used to say uh, centuries ago, they would greet each other by saying, he has risen, and the other person would reply, he has risen indeed. So I'm no fan of using the word Easter. It drives me absolutely bonkers uh, for the obvious reasons. I like to call it Resurrection Sunday because that's what it is. Happy Res Day. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Happy Resurrection Day. So that's where I'm at with all this. Anyway, folks, so that's that's where we are. Uh, King Abdullah is back in the news, back on my radar, uh, checking out, checking all this out. Be very interesting to see where it all goes. Incoming call. We've got live radio here, folks. Anyway, I'm going to take a quick break, and we'll see you at the other side of it. You're listening to Acceleration Radio. This is your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli. We'll be back to you on the other side of the break. 
We're back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli. You've been listening to Acceleration Radio. Our special guest tonight, author Bill Salas, the author of Psalm 83, The Missing Prophecy Revealed. Of course, we've had Bill on many times on this show. Bill is also the author of Israelistein. He's also a radio host, conference speaker, and the author of Israelistein. Gee, was that redundant? The Ancient Blueprints of the Future Middle East and Revelation Road, a a fictional book, which is sort of interesting. His two timely books featuring the Arab-Israeli War of Psalm 83 have earned him the respect of many of today's top eschatologists. Visit Bill's website at www.prophecydepot.com. That's a great title. Bill, welcome to Acceleration Radio. Hey, L.A., it's great to be back on your program. Well, it's always good to have you here, sir. You're, let, me ask, let me just jump right in here because, you know, you're into the whole Psalm 83 thing, and I remember when you first came out with the book years ago, um, everyone who believed in the Ezekiel prophecy was the next thing. We all said, well, that's impossible. Ezekiel, uh, Salas is just absolutely crazy, and it's got to be Ezekiel 37. Of course, I was one of them, but I listened to you, read the book, and uh, now I, I've, been, I've been including you, or at least the Psalm 83 scenario. If I'm ever talking about the Middle East, I always include Psalm 83 because as you and I have talked off the record and even on the record, we're not sure how this whole thing's coming down in what order. But I would I lean very heavily, uh, especially now after the Arab Spring, uh, to the Psalm 83 scenario. Bill, with all the nonsense that's going on, I don't know whether you've heard the rumors about Assad uh, being shot by his bodyguard. No one has seen him, by the way, in over eight days now. Uh, what are your thoughts on Syria, the Assad assassination, what that holds for us, um, the Arab Spring, the saber-rattling between Hezbollah, Hamas, Iran? I mean, there's so much to look at. I'm just going to turn it over to you because that's – I just gave you about 20 questions in that little opening. So, Bill, take it take it away, please. Okay, so you can go ahead and have your coffee break then, and I'll just talk about <laughs> 15 minutes. No, I'm, I'm uh, listening very intently, sir. <laughs> Well, uh, L.A., the, uh, the rumors of Assad's death are rumors, of course, as you say. We don't know for sure. Um, but basically the whole gambit of events that surround Israel has got Israel in its greatest existential threat ever in its, its ancient history of well over 3,000 years, 3,300 years. Because the enemies of Israel, <clears throat> excuse me, after the Arab Spring, have the arsenals now that can wipe them off the map. And and that's the very thing that Psalm 83 talks about, a confederacy of Arab populations that share common borders with Israel and the terrorist populations within those borders, which you mentioned, Hamas and Hezbollah. And, of course, now you've got the Muslim Brotherhood. Sure. But they want to come together, form a plan, and they want to destroy the nation that the name Israel can be no more in remembrance. And they want to wipe Israel off the map. So I, I'm really concerned that we're at that point right now. The Psalm 83 missing prophecy revealed how Israel becomes the next Mideast superpower. Title says a whole mouthful there. And it's, it was a missing prophecy because most scholars didn't look at it from a prophetic perspective. They simply looked at it as an imprecatory prayer of lament. And so it took a little while to convince people that the hypothesis that I forwarded in Israelistine in the summer of 2008 – uh, really was a valid hypothesis that, that, that this is a bona fide prophecy with the contemporary group uh, that forms a plan. And, and I get into the book very specifically how we can confirm it. It's, not, it's more than just a chronological ordering of Israel's ancient enemies, but it's a, a bona fide prophecy that appears to be eminent for our generation. Mm. And that's why it's important, like, like guys like yourself, looked at it, you know, from the different angles and then kind of needed a little bit of talking and studying and, and things like that. And, and that's been the process. Uh, some people jumped right on board. So, wow, this is that prophecy we missed. And once you find it, it puts, fits in the, the missing puzzle piece of all end times prophecy. Because once it happens, the other prophecies can follow right on, on its heels soon and sequentially mm-hmm. thereafter. So I've, I've enjoyed these kind of conversations. You and I have had plenty of them where we've talked about well, what, could it be part of Ezekiel 38? Uh, is it is it really a prophecy? Uh, wasn't it already fulfilled in the past, or mm-hmm. you know, or is it part of Armageddon? So I really I, I tackle all those because when those objections were po- brought to my attention, I carefully and prayerfully wanted to consider them because I don't want to stand before the Lord and have Him say, "Well, you did a pretty good job, but you really messed up on Psalm 83, and you and you misled a lot of people." Because as you know, La. Uh, Bible prophecy is intended to 
change lives, prepare people for what's coming. I've had a lot of people make big decisions based on the types of things I teach, and I'm sure you have too. So we don't want to stumble people or be wrong. And we're told in Second Peter one twenty that no prophecy of Scripture is subject to private interpretation. So, you know, we have these diverse views in many cases where we – some of them enhance one another's teachings. You know, oh, there's a detail that I missed that L.A.'s God or something. But some of them are wrong, you know. And so we have to be careful because, like you say, we do look through a glass. And I'm paraphrasing what you said, but we look at it through a glass right now somewhat dimly as to what the prophecy is going to be. And so we try to find the details we can, and some prophecies are more specific than others. But the generation that experiences a prophecy – We'll have the hindsight to say, hey, that's exactly what happened, and here's how it played out. But So we're doing the best we can, and I think it's important for prophecy guys like yourself to at least mention that Psalm 83 could fit into the equation. Because oh, if, you, if you don't, if you don't, then, you know, there's, there's going to be some explaining that has to be done when it happens. And, 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 I, and I say that, like, for instance, you know, these, these lukewarm churches out there that aren't even teaching Bible prophecy certainly don't even know about Psalm 83, when the missiles are flying in every which direction in the Middle East and Damascus gets destroyed in Isaiah 17 and mm-hmm. Egypt comes under the tor- turmoil in Isaiah 19 and Ezekiel 29, they're going to have some explaining to do. And and so I'm just trying to be, lovingly caution teachers, you know, be open to it, folks. You know, understand the hypothesis that's out there because it does seem to be very real and the prophecy for our time to be watching for. <clears throat> That's a great answer. And, and of course, what we see um, is this constant imbroglio happening in the Middle East with no, no peace in sight. I mean, it's worse now. And what amazes me, Bill, and I know what amazes you, too, we've talked about this before. I mean, we've been talking about this for five or six years now. It just goes on and on and on and on. And how it can even go on another day without the whole place you know, going up in smoke is, is really, in my opinion, miraculous. Because the vitriol between these different groups like Hamas and Hezbollah and, of course, the Muslim Brotherhood. I show a clip. Now, I, I did it when we were both in, um, in Dallas at the conference there. Uh, I, I completely took a, a left turn from where – or a right turn from where I usually speak on is UFOs and Nephilim. And, and I took my hour in the big room and did a whole piece on the rise of anti-Semitism because the rise of anti-Semitism is just – I've never seen anything like it. I mean I, I'm alarmed. By what I see, I had a, a row with a guy over the uh, over the weekend who emailed me, and I won't mention any names here, but this guy's got a website and a radio show, and he's calling me out and other people out and making a big deal about it because, you know, we're he called us dispensationalists, and I don't call myself anything but a Christian who's just read the Bible over and over and over and over and over again and say, wow, we're in the last days here. Um, you know, Jesus tells us that these are the signs, wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. It's going on. These are the last days, in my opinion. And, of course, as, as Hal Lindsey said, you know, decades ago, Israel has been regathered from the homeland. Of course, this guy believes that these are not really the Jews. He gets into the whole, uh, in my opinion, blasphemous interpretation of the of the uh the scripture those who say there are jews but are not jews i had dr stephen Yulish address that several times on the blog on this radio show and and, and give, giving a great exegesis of what that scripture actually means but these guys take this and twist it and try to tell us these are not the jews that are in israel bill how would you answer that question i mean how do you because this you know these guys are like they're banging a drum man they really are and and they confuse a lot of people and they call us heretics and all this other stuff because we believe that Israel and the Jews that are there are the chosen people, that God's not done with them, that he's gathered them back into the homeland uh, for this specific end time period. And they will go through the time of Jacob's trouble with Jacob, not Bob, Fred or Ernie. So, Bill, please weigh in. Well, yes, L.A., and I get this question to me quite a bit, as you can imagine as well. And it is a minority voice out there that's creating this ruckus. First, I say, you know, first, if if these aren't the Jews, uh, Hitler sure had an identity crisis when he was trying yeah, to figure out. Really, yeah, he really didn't he? <laughs> and, and Mohammed Morsi has got an identity crisis because he's calling them bloodsuckers and descendants of apes and pigs. And all the Arabs call them the Jews. I mean, so... Now, I know, that, I know the difficulty is that in 70 AD, when the Romans destroyed the second Jewish temple, all the descendant records and genealogical records were destroyed. <clears throat> but we have Bible prophecies, a plethora of them, that clearly tell us that there's going to be a rebirth of the nation of Israel 
and and we could just quote a handful of them right off the top. Uh, Ezekiel 36 verses 20 through through 24 sure. says they're going to be brought out of the nations of the world, not for their sake, but for God's holy name's sake. So in other words, they would be brought back into the land of Israel in a condition of unbelief. Uh, much like the condition when they left in 70 AD. And we see that's the case. It'll be the latter years, we're told, in Ezekiel 38, 8. They'll come out of a Holocaust condition in Ezekiel 37, 11, and 12, the dry bones vision. Um, we're told in Jeremiah 16, verses 14 through 15, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that it shall no, no more be said, The Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. But the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. For I will bring them back into their land, which I gave their fathers. What Jeremiah is saying is that when this fulfillment of prophecy happens, the super sign that Jesus pointed to in the parable of the fig tree in in, uh, Matthew 24, the super sign of the end times, it's going to be a bigger miracle than the parting of the Red Seas. It's no longer will they talk about the, the momentous a miracle, the Hebrew exodus out of Egypt. It's going to be, and this is what they're missing, L.A., and this is this is why this is a bigger issue than than people like to make of it. They've missed it. This, these, these are the Jews. They're coming into the land of Israel out of all the different nations of the world after 1,878 years of dispersion in the diaspora, different mm-hmm. languages, different cultures into a land right. that was quite hostile, that was desolate. It's the biggest miracle. If people ask me, is God still in the miracle business? I just point to Israel and the rebirth in 1948. There it is. I, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this one particular guy, I mean, look, there's a bunch of them out there who are, you know, banging that drum. And, it, and it's total anti-Semitic. I mean, they don't, know, they don't know scripture. They don't know prophecy. They've got this twisted exegesis um, of, of the prophetic word. And, you know, they're, they're, it's a very small minority, but they're out there. And they're branding all of us as heretics. And you know what? We need to pray for these people. We really do. I mean, they need to understand that they're, they're like Paul, like Saul of Tarsus, because before he became Paul of Tarsus, I mean, they're, they've got that same rabid mentality. They just need to take a deep breath and, and ask themselves that these are not the Jews, then who is? And we better get these people. Then I guess God made a grave mistake because the latter rain's falling. Uh, the earthquakes have basically stopped. The locusts, even though there was a, um, a – the locusts used to come up every year. Every year. Now, they're back, they're back this year, which is, you know, a biblical proportion. I get that. But certain signs have happened in Israel. The desert blooms again. I mean, there's over a billion trees in there. Uh, the, 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 the language of Hebrew is spoken for the first time in, like, you know, over a thousand years. It was a dead language. And that's been resurrected. So, um, you know, if this, isn't, if this isn't the nation of Israel, not the whole house of Israel, I get that. But a good portion of it is there then I don't know who is, and we better start over again. But let's go back to the Muslim Brotherhood. I think we've, we've kind of covered that. When Morsi, and this just drives me bonkers, you know, we, are, we spend trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars in this country, and yet we, we somehow can give the Muslim Brotherhood who have sworn, and, and I've got a clip of this, and I show it when I'm out. Uh, I was saying earlier on the whole anti-Semitic thing, when uh, this this very fiery imam by the name of Hagazi stands up screaming at the top of his lungs, you know, uh, to Jerusalem we go, martyrs in the millions, and declaring that Jerusalem will be the capital of the United States, the United Arab States. So we got a real problem here. We just gave uh, Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood thugs $250 million dollars, that's a lot of money. And, of course, then we gave the King of Jordan about $220 million. We're also giving uh, Egypt a bunch of planes and armaments and all this stuff. It's just typical. You know, we, we're, we, we say we're for Israel, and yet we arm her enemies. Where do you think this is going when you got guys like Morsi, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Imam Higazi, you know, all calling for, basically all calling for the death of uh, the Jewish state of, of Israel? Well, I think it's going to the sequence of end times Bible prophecies in Psalm 83 that then segues into, I think, Ezekiel 38. But there's, you know, I apologize, LA, I've been getting over a cold, and so my voice is cracking a little bit. But um, but we love to hear you, Bill. Go. Okay. Um, Well, you should have seen me on TBN the other night. I barely made it through. But um, (laughs) the the thing is, is that um, there's peripheral prophecies, too. Not just the big Psalm 83 and Ezekiel 38. These these are big Bible wars of you know epic biblical proportion. But you've got the Egypt stuff. You got Syria. 
Um, you've got prophecy centered around Jordan and things like that as well. So we're talking about Egypt. So we'll, we'll go there for a moment because there's a saying that goes, as goes Egypt, so goes the whole Middle East. It's the number mm. one Arab populated country in the Middle East. Uh, there's 80 to 83 million Egyptians, we say, and there's about 10 million Coptic Christians in that mix. And they're ranked number 16 among world armies. They're the strongest world ranked army in all of the Psalm 83 Confederacy, which, which we'll list who that, those participants are, I'm sure, in this hour. But, but when you talk about the Muslim Brotherhood, they were founded in 1928 by um, Hassan al And that was just six years after Egypt regained its statehood in 1922. And it was he was a, a political and religious scholar, and he was a devout follower of Adolf Hitler. And matter of fact, the Muslim Brotherhood was going to be the extension of the Third Reich, the Nazi regime, into the Middle East. Of course, we know the Nazi regime failed. That didn't happen. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood, of course, went out and attempted to kill President Gamal, Gamal Nasser, and and he was uh, he survived that. So the Muslim Brotherhood all of a sudden became persecuted for that and they were successful in actually killing Anwar Sadat Mm -hmm. in October 6th of 1981. Of course that was a problem. Now they became further persecuted and Hosni Mubarak himself kept them persecuted. He didn't want them to form a coup and overthrow his government. So for three or four decades they were repressed. But now it's their time to shine. Now they founded the Hamas in 1987. That was their political arm into the, the Gaza. And the Hamas came out with a charter in 1988, a political charter, and three of their primary tenants still alive today. It says Israel will exist and continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it to the land of Palestine because they don't recognize Israel's right to exist. Right. They call it Palestine. Sure. is to be Islamic, consecrated to future Muslim generations until Judgment Day. And three, there's only one solution to resolve the conflict, and that is jihad, not, not land for peace deals. Matter yeah. of fact, if you, if you look at the Muslim Brotherhood's credos, because, see, uh, the Obama, the reason this is significant is the Obama administration has legitimized the Muslim Brotherhood as the democratically elected party of Egypt right now. And here's their credos. Um, Islam is a solution. You can find these on their website. Allah is our objective. The Quran is our law. The Prophet Muhammad is our leader. And jihad is our way. And death for Allah is is the highest aspiration. Uh, <laughs> okay. I mean, it's, yeah, there you go. So there's a, that's not your, not your Western-style democracy that the liberal no. pundits thought was going to kick in during the Arab Spring. You know, they thought it was a youth polls driven by the social networks of Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And they were able, you know, that the Arab youth were able to look outside of 7th century Islam and state-censored media and get a glimpse of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. But, but what I tell people is in Daniel 2.21, it says that the Lord changes times and seasons. He removes and raises up kings. And he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those that has understanding. And as we all know, L.A., there's a season of change going on in the Middle East. There's a uh, leaders have been removed and other ones are being re- raised up. The ones removed were not the best tools in the chest. They were not the best apples in the grove. You know, Libya's President Gaddafi, 40-plus years, He, you know, he was a bad apple. Mubarak... Yeah. But he kept peace, you know, for 30 years with Egypt, sure. Israel. Um, then you had Yemen go of uh, Saleh of Yemen, and you had Benin al-Ali of Tunisia. But those guys were not the guys that were going to make war with Israel. But the guys that are in power now, and we'll, we'll end by talking about Mubarak and the Sigazi. Uh, but you've got Hassan Nasrallah of Hezbollah. You've got Mashal and Haniyah of Hamas. You've got Ahmadinejad and uh, Khamenei of Iran. Assad, if he's still alive in Syria. I mean, the list goes on. And now you now you got to add Muslim Brotherhood, Mohammed Morsi. Now, Safad Hagazi, for your listeners who can't watch that video, because I've seen that video, it's very powerful. Very powerful, absolutely. A of 2012, it was really the, the, the premier campaign assembly for the Muslim Brotherhood's candidate, Mohammed Morsi, to win the elections, which he did win in June of 2012. And they were going to liberate the Gaza... And there's tens of thousands of people in the streets of Cairo sh- shouting this chance with Higazi. And Muslim bro- and Morsi sitting on the stage right there, you know, not denying it, not, not waving his hands in there, going, no, 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 don't, don't, not. <laughs> What's doing that? He was sitting there soaking it all in, basking in his glory. They were going to liberate the Gaza. They were going to form a United States of the Arabs. 
which is interesting, they've already got a 22-member Arab League founded in Cairo in 1945, which is essentially unaffected. But they want to form a United States of the Arabs, and they don't want Cairo to be its capital. They want Jerusalem. They're going to march to Jerusalem. A million million martyrs march to Jerusalem, it says on here. Safadi Gwazi comes out in August of 2012 on TV, and he says, yes, the day will come when we will be the masters of the world. He goes on to say, if not through peace, there is nothing preventing war. We welcome war. See, this is what is the, where this is headed. And and so, you know, we're talking about this on a secular, you know, this is the news, this is the current events, this is the dangers of the Middle East. But, but I both, when we want to know the future of the Middle East, we don't have to watch CNN or Fox or, mm. you know, the Al Jazeera shows. We've got so many prophecies dealing with Egypt, dealing with Hamas, uh, dealing with the whole Psalm 83 thing and whatnot. So um, to me, L.A., the wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those that have understanding is that the Lord in his mercy has extended the international community six decades because Israel celebrates its 65th birthday this May 14th. Um, uh, they were founded in 1948. Mm-hmm. Um, the international community has not been able to resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict because they don't understand it. And now it's too late because the enemies of Israel have the arsenals to accomplish their goal, which is to push the Jews into the sea, wipe the nation of Israel off the map, that the name of Israel can be remembered no more. And to me, L.A., that's where we're at right now. That's why I think the Psalm 83 book that I've just released has become a bestseller. It's been on 15 TV shows in two months. This message <laughs> is being projected out into the international community. And it's going to, like I said, it's going to be on TBN, which will hit the whole world. Um, that comes out. The, are you airing this program this week? Is that yeah, your goal? Yeah, yeah, yes. This, this comes out this week. So this message that the Arabs are going to come together and try to wipe out the Jews is resonating because I think the Lord wants people to know this is the prophecy for our time right now. Hmm. It certainly is. And, you know, it's, it just amazes me that when we, when we go back two years now at the nascent beginnings of the Arab Spring, no one, we interviewed for, for our Watchers series, we sat down with uh, uh, Jonathan Daniels, who's the senior advisor to Danny Danner, the speaker of the Knesset in Israel. And we asked him point blank, got all this on film, did anybody see this? The Mossad, you know, uh, Shin Bet, anybody, you know, anybody in the Israel cabinet see the Arab Spring? It caught everybody by surprise, caught everybody by surprise. And so now what we see is that, you know, uh, dictator after dictator had been toppled uh, by the Arab Spring and a lot of instability and the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood. And then, of course, we get to Syria, where 75,000 people, Syrians, have been killed in a very bloody civil war with no end in sight, of course, unless Assad is dead. And we know, Bill, that Assad specifically said that if I am killed or assassinated in any way, then go to war with Israel. What are your thoughts on that? And double question here, as usual. Um, we also know that the prophecy of Isaiah 17, Damascus, it may become a ruinous heap, which may be being fulfilled because we're seeing Scud missiles uh, turned loose in Damascus. Uh, and we're seeing that city literally becoming a heap of ruin, a rubble, brick by brick, day by day. It's just, a, it's not what we think it is. It, this, we may be looking at the fulfillment of prophecy. I'm not saying this is, but my gosh, it's like who would have imagined two or three years ago that, that sections of Damascus would be totally uh, annihilated just and, 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 and reduced to rubble. What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, a couple things. You're absolutely right. And before I talk about Syria, I want to give your listeners a brief roadmap overview of the bigger prophecy in Psalm 83 because it, it, I believe it involves Syria. And I'm just going to, I can do this. I've done hundreds of these. I can wrap this up in about two minutes for you. Yeah, take your time, man. Um, We've got time. Go for it, Bill. Yeah, we, we talked basically that this psalm uh, written 3,000 years ago by Asaph, who we were told in Second Chronicles 29 30 was a seer. The Hebrew word is choza, it means a beholder of vision. He was a prophet. And he wrote 12 psalms, and among all of them, the, the most prophetic was Psalm 83. And the psalm is nothing short of a uh, genocidal attempt of the Jewish people, the chosen people, and a, and a confiscation of the promised land. That's what they want to accomplish. And I said they formed crafty council, and they want to destroy Israel, that the name can be remembered no more. Verse 12 tells us, tells us why. They want the pastures of God for their possession. They want the promised land. Um, but I want to tell you, listeners, who's involved 
and how the Lord will deal with this psalm. And then I'm going to shoot into the Syria thing. Uh, who's involved were given by their ancient names, Edomites, Ammonites, Moabites, Gigabites, Termites, Parasites, etc. <laughs> that um, <laughs> I, I like to say that because a lot of your listeners don't know these names and they'll go, gigabytes. Wait a hey, what? I thought that was a new term. My my son, college son was teaching me that the other day. That's great. But um, you know, so so nobody really knows who those people are. They they were they were the, the populations of Asaph's time. He did not have Palestinians and Hezbollah and Jordanians back then. And who they are is north to south. We got Lebanon to the north with Hezbollah. You got Syria to the northeast. You got Jordan to the east. You got Saudi Arabia to the southeast. You got the Palestinians, the Palestinian refugees. You got the Hamas and the Gaza, the ancient Philistia. You got Egypt, and of course now you got the Muslim Brotherhood. These are the primary people involved, and as you know, there's terrorist populations I just mentioned. And how they're going to be dealt with, Asaph petitions the Lord in verses 9 through 11 to deal with them with the historical precedent of the time of Gideon when he dealt with the Midianites and with uh, the prophetess Deborah and her general Barak of the Israelites when they dealt with the Canaanites. And I get into why and, and the prophecies of the Israeli Defense Forces that will actually deal with the Psalm 83 nations. So what, what, what Asaph was saying is, Lord, deal with them by empowering the IDF, which is what, what exactly happened to those historical accounts in Judges chapters 4 through 8. Empower the IDF to defeat these enemies that they can't accomplish their goal to take the promised land and that they will cease to ever oppress us again, make it a top-to-bottom finish. And that's what he's saying. And therefore, we now know through other prophecies that connect that the Israeli Defense Forces today exist in fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Ezekiel 37.10 says, they will become an exceedingly great army. Ezekiel 25.14 says, I will execute my vengeance on Edom by the hand of my people Israel. They shall know my vengeance and fury. Uh, Obadiah 1.18 says, the house of Jacob will be a a fire, the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau shall be stubble, and no survivor shall remain. This is the, the fortune of the, the lot of Esau. See, mm-hmm. uh, now, for the, the Edom and Esau, they were connected. Esau fathered the Edomites. Esau was Jacob's twin brother. Jacob was later called Israel. So what we have here is the Edomites are the number one participant listed in Psalm 83. They're listed first. And so what we're talking about here is you know, when they say we're going to execute vengeance on Edom by the hand of my people Israel, it's a clear reference to it's. It's not God. It's not America. Uh, it's not the Messiah. It's the Israeli Defense Forces for this specific incident. They're not going to be involved in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that much. They're not going to be involved in Armageddon. They're involved in defeating the Arab enemies of Psalm 83. Now they're ranked number 10. The IDF is ranked number 10 among all world armies. They're ranked the number highest spot in the Middle East. Iran is ranked number 12. Egypt is ranked number 16. And Saudi Arabia is ranked number 26. That's Hmm. how they shake down in some of the top populations. Now, so basically Israel's going to win. And and they're going to, and and this is part of the subtitle, it says... um, how Israel becomes the next media superpower. They're going to do what they did in 1967, in my estimation. And I point out the scriptures. I don't make this up. I point out the scriptures that say this in the Bible. They're going to spread out their elbows in their victory. And they're going to annex some more territory, just like they did in 1967. It makes their mm-hmm. borders more defensible. Mm-hmm. Uh, King David did it when he won wars 3,000 years ago. And Joshua did it 3,300 years ago when he won the wars. And the IDF did it in 1967. They're going to take over parts of Jordan, probably parts of uh, east, northeast Egypt. They're going to take over parts of southern Lebanon. Again, the scriptures are in the book. I'm not just pulling this off the top of my head. Now, Syria. Uh, do you want me to shoot into that one real quick? Absolutely, please. Okay, um, you're absolutely right. In May of 2000, excuse me, in December of 2011, after uh, or it was the latter part of 2011, maybe not December. After um, when, when uh, Bashar Assad saw that NATO got involved in the Libyan war. And they saw the ta- and he saw the tide shift toward the uh, Gaddafi's was going to lose, and ultimately Gaddafi took a bullet to the head. As he saw that tide shift, there was rumblings from Turkey, who was involved in NATO, because they were getting a, a refugee crisis as Assad's revolution was burgeoning, and there were uh, Syrian refugees flooding into southern Turkey. Assad uh, Erdogan, the prime minister of Turkey, was saying. We want NATO to get involved in Syria. And that's when Assad said, if NATO gets involved in my revolution, 
in six hours, I will lob missiles into Tel Aviv. Right. In three hours, right. I will have Hezbollah lob missiles into Tel Aviv. And in the next three hours, I will have Iran um, protect the Persian Gulf from international intervention, which tells us one important thing there, that they're all connected. And you throw the Hamas in there, too. Matter of fact, in December of 2009, uh, after the Operation Cast Lead in, in 2008 and early mm-hmm. 2009 with Hamas and Israel, um, there was bona fide war pact signed in Tehran between Iran, Hezbollah, Syria, and Hamas that if any of them got in- involved in a conflict with Israel, they would all come to fight together. These are bona fide war pacts still in place. So when Assad, that's not an idle threat when he says I'll have Hezbollah and Iran engage also. So now here's the problem. You've got these chemical weapons moving around in Syria. <laughs> you have... Um, Scud Ds, which are the most powerful Scud missiles in the world, they're not the indiscriminate Scud As that Saddam Hussein lobbed into Israel. You just shoot them up and hope they stick somewhere. No, the Scud Ds are, are pinpoint accuracy. They can go four, over 400 miles and land within a 20-yard radius, and they can carry a chemical payload. So in any any place in northern Syria could any hit any place in southern Israel wherever they want. They can hit right in the middle of Demona's nuclear plant if they want. Mm, mm. So Israel's very concerned about this. Now, um, when you talk about this, we're going to take it into the Bible. Isaiah 17, 1 says, The burden against Damascus, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. So it's clearly tuck, and the Hebrew words is clearly says reduced to rubble. It will be non-existent. Now, Damascus is the capital city of Syria. As you mentioned, there's already a lot of infighting going on in there. Um, it's, a, it's, it's the oldest continuously inhabited city in recorded history. dates back beyond the time of Abraham, over 4,000 years ago. Um, there's several million Syrians that live in and around Syria. A lot of them have become refugees, of course, but there's still many, many millions of Syrian, refugee, Syrian people living near Damascus. This is a really big deal. Now, when some people say... Uh, Damascus is going to be destroyed here in Isaiah 17. They say, well, no, no, that was already fulfilled in 732 B.C. by the Assyrian Empire. Dr. Right. Mark Hitchcock says this in his book. And and Mark's my friend. But I say to him, and I write about this in the book, I say, you know, in his 66 chapters in Isaiah, he mentions Assyria uh, 37 times, but he doesn't mention them once in Isaiah 17. Hmm. What he does say in verse 9, in self-defense, it says, in that day, his strong city, speaking to Syria, the strong cities of Syria, will be as a forsaken bough in an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, not the children of Assyria. Assyria. And there will be desolation, it says. And, and, and you read the verses that, that go between verse 1 and verse 9, and you realize it's not Israel being the aggressor, it's Israel being the defender of their existence. But then what's, what's very troubling in very real time right now, L.A., is the final verse of Isaiah 17 says, And behold, at eventide trouble, and before the morning he is no more, speaking of Damascus and the masculine pronoun. So this is the portion of those who plunder us and the lot of those who rob us. Isaiah speaking as the speaker of the Hebrews, uh, rob us and plunder us, being the Jews. So what you have is here, one evening you see Damascus, but in the morning it's gone. And Israel has the firepower to do that. And and so the, the concern is that Assad will do something and provoke Israel to defend itself. And there you could see a nuclear blast go off. You could see a weapon of mass destruction or multiple weapons of mass destruction entered into the theater. And I think that's what's going to happen. And I think that's going to shock the world. You know, it's interesting when America uh, sent its uh, nuclear weapons into Japan. It was ranked number 14 among all world armies. You know what it was ranked the very next morning after the nuclear weapon went off? Uh-uh. Number one wow. among all world armies. So, you know, Israel is, it's, I told you, they're going to be an exceedingly great army. They're a great army right now, but they're going to be exceedingly great. And they may, and they'll get that after they uh, achieve victory over their Arabs in Psalm 83. But you might see they achieve that because they launched a weapon of mass destruction. Now, Syria has weapons of mass destruction. That's what chemical weapons are. Matter of fact, we think they have the third largest undisclosed arsenal of uh, chemical weapons, and they're floating around loosely in Israel right now. Israel has, most Israelis have gas masks, and they're very concerned that they're going to come under a chemical attack. And th- this is a daily threat over there in Israel. So anyway, that's my spiel on Syria. I'm glad you gave me so much time to talk about it. 
Oh, that's you know, it's it's very informative, and it's a really good overview of, of what uh, is happening in the Middle East, and, and you did that with great erudition on your part. Uh, moving on here, because we're down to about the twelve minute mark before we have to sign off, but um, let me ask you something. Uh, I know you're not a date setter, nor am I. Give us a few scenarios and your opinion how the Psalm eighty three war may get started. I mean, we can we can probably do this all afternoon if we want to. But um, give us give us what your let's say maybe top two scenarios are where this thing might come down. Okay, I'm gonna I want to do that. I, I think it's important we talk about one thing as I preface it. Okay, uh, you know the whole thing with the Muslim Brotherhood. And all these people, it's, it's Jerusalem. The, United, uh, the Palestinians, of course, just achieved non-member observer state status at the end of 2012. Um, you know, and, and now they, they want Jerusalem to be their eternal capital. Matter of fact, just yesterday, um, uh, King Abdullah uh, II of Jordan signed a uh, yes. pact with uh, Abbas mm -hmm. to, retain, uh, to retain the Arab character uh, and protection of Jerusalem. Matter of fact, the Arab League with Qatar at the helm with the new uh, lead, leader of the Arab League, uh, Emir Al Thani, uh, they recently just said we are going to preserve the character, the Arab character of Jerusalem, because they call it the third holiest site in Islam. Although it's not mentioned once, not mentioned in the Quran, yeah, it's mentioned over <laughs> a thousand times by seventy different names in the Bible, right? But not mentioned in the in the Quran. But they're trying to preserve the the integrity of Jerusalem. They're trying they're trying to take Jerusalem over. And and here's the problem that you got. And I think this is critical because it's, it really Psalm 83 could happen in a plethora of ways. But what what it boils down to is the core fabric. They want they want another Arab state. They don't want peace with the Jews. They want peace without the Jews. They don't want a two state solution. They want a one state solution. Right. They want to call a state Palestine and wave the, Pal the flag of Palestine over it. And they want Jerusalem to be their capital. The problem they've got is in Zechariah 12, verses 2 and, and 6. And, and it's going to happen. It says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all yeah. the surrounding people when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. It says when they lay siege, not, not if. And it's the surrounding peoples, not the whole world. Right. Verse 3 does talk about Jerusalem being a burdensome stone to all nations. That, that's true. That's going to be the issue. Anybody that tries to divide Jerusalem up or whatever, and ultimately that, that all takes place in the Armageddon campaign. We're talking about the surrounding peoples. They will try to lay siege on Jerusalem. But we're told in verse uh, 6, In that day I will make the governors of Judah, read that as the captains of Judah, like a fire pan in the woodpile, and like a fiery torch in the sheaves, they shall devour all the surrounding peoples. Amazing. See, it's different than Armageddon. Armageddon, the, the Lord Christ, he comes back and he defeats the Antichrist and the armies of Armageddon. Right, right. This is the captains of Judah. This is the IDF. They will be like a fire pan in the woodpile, like a fiery torch in the sheaves, and they shall devour all the surrounding peoples. And it says on the right hand and on the left, but Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place. So in other words, they will try to lay siege on Jerusalem. They're trying to uphold the inte Arab integrity of Jerusalem, but it's God's holy city. Uh, we're told in Jeremiah 49, 25, it's the city of praise. It's the city of God's joy. I mean, it's all over the Bible. Um, it's going to happen, L.A. And they're, they're making their political strides right now. Uh, the, the Arab League is going to spend a, million, uh, a billion dollars to try to preserve the Arab character of, of Jerusalem. And they're not going to just settle for non-member observer state status. They're going to want to have a Palestinian state. They don't want peace with the Jews. So here's how this could shake down. Um, and, I, and I start with the very basics. Remember that the 34-day conflict between Hezbollah and Israel in the summer of 2006 was started mm -hmm. by two IDF soldiers. And 4,000 missiles were subsequently lobbed into northern Israel from Hezbollah. That's how that started. Now, we've got bigger issues in different ways this could start right now. One scenario is Israel could strike Iran's nuclear sites. That's definitely on the horizon. That's a great possibility. And that could then in turn... Uh, you know, Iran's Iran's not going to just take one on the chin. They're going to uh, call on their proxies and, and whatever whatever success they can have with Hezbollah and Syria and Hamas to uh, probably go into confrontations with Israel as well as Iran itself. That's one. Uh, the other possibility is uh, a hail mary, Scud D with chemicals from uh, Bashar Assad if he's not dead yet, or Hezbollah doing something right. 
Or it could even be the Syrian opposition because they're a, a band of rebels as well. I mean, you got Al Qaeda and Muslim Brotherhood, and it's it's anything but free, and it's almost anything but serious. Um, there are many true Syrians, or they're wanting change, but fortunately, that that revolution is going to be hijacked, hijacked by the Muslim Brotherhood. So the, these things could go on, but once it happens, LA, it's not going to be a long, protracted war of attrition. Israel has no history of fighting those and their modern history, and they have no ability to fight. They cannot absorb hundreds of thousands of missiles coming into them. Hezbollah has about 50,000. Syria's got, I don't know, one or 200,000 of them. Uh, Egypt's got so many. You know, when the missiles are starting to fly in whatever direction they're going to start to fly, Israel's going to act expeditiously and decisively, and they're going to make a statement. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen quickly, and Israel's going to be the victim. Hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's amazing that all this is written thousands of years ago by the prophets. It's all in the book, uh, you know, the Holy Bible. It's all there uh, for, for the reading. And most people, and this is what sort of drives me nuts about um, some of the distractions that we get, like the Mayan prophecy. And now, of course, the with all due respect, Chris Putman is going to be on the show here. And I think in the next couple of weeks, we'll be talking about not only Petrus Romanos, but Exo Vaticana and all that, the new book coming out. And look, I, I understand the whole Petrus Romanos thing. It, it's very interesting. But like you, Bill, in my opinion, nothing should ever usurp real biblical prophecy. And more people, unfortunately, know more about or knew more about the uh, the 2012 nonsense with uh, you know Quetzalcoatl and the crew down in Mexico, which was a total no-show, than they do about Ezekiel 37, Psalm 83, or Isaiah 17. And we're, we're in it. We're in it up to our eyeballs. And it's amazing how our media sort of ignores, even now, is ignoring really what's going on in the Middle East and they, what's happening with Lilo, you know, the, the, over here and, you know, OJ or, gee, American Idol is the lowest rating ever. I mean, it's like, what? Meanwhile, the Middle and nothing's changed over there. That's what people don't get. Nothing has changed. The situation is more tenuous now than ever before, and it's not getting any better. And then, you know, you get Obama over there and, you know, all this other nonsense and John Kerry, and we try to placate them by throwing money at them, uh, you know, specifically the Egyptians or Jordanians, but that's not going to work forever. And it's really, in my opinion, sort of a a, a deal with the devil, as if, if you will. Um, look, we're, we're we're down to the last six minutes of, of the show. Give us your website information, how do they, how people can contact you, uh, where to get the book, and um, your closing thoughts. Absolutely, and and LA, uh, I'm going to do that. But the comment about Obama and John Kerry, you know, they're not offering anything new. No. See, here's, here's the problem, you know. They're going to come over there and and put the screws on Netanyahu. They've already asked him <laughs> yeah. to make a phone call. As with, always. Uh, with Prime Minister Erdogan, you know, let's let's be best friends uh, with uh, Prime Minister Erdogan. And, uh, you know, it's just if, if they were bringing something new to the table, uh, really all they're doing right now is saying, look, we, we got your back on Iran and – which is very dangerous because Obama moved the timetable out. Like they won't have a nuclear weapon for a year when everybody else is thinking it's probably by July or the summer. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we got your back. Even though our new Secretary of Defense, Hegel, is anti-Semitic and thinks you're the bully in the neighborhood. And even <laughs> though, uh, you know, Brennan is probably a closet Muslim. I mean, but we got your back. Now all you need to do is make peace with the Palestinians and give them a bunch of your land. Now you notice that the Arabs are not doing anything – to, to make concessions here. It's always Israel. So there's no oh, nothing there's nothing that Obama has on the table other than a increased promise of security that is going to change the, the, the scenario over there. And and I just don't think the Lord is going to allow the international community much more time. Now as far as my website, it's prophecydepot.com. Prophecy depot like Home Depot.com. And the book that I'm just written two months ago is called Psalm 83, The Missing Prophecy Revealed. Missing because most of today's top Bible prophecy scholars miss the intrinsic prophetic aspects of it. And two, because once you understand it, it, it was that missing piece in the end times puzzle that completes the prophecy picture. Mm. Um, and the subtitle is How Israel Becomes the Next Midi Superpower. L.A., my, my closing thoughts are that the world is going to be shocked here real soon to see many, many things in, 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 in the world, world change. The things you talk about with uh, the Petrus Romanus, the, the new pope thing, mm -hmm. that's important. 
Yeah, it is. The, the, I believe the right. Vatican is, is right. probably the the left behind aspects of Roman Catholicism. It's probably re- referred to in Revelation 17 as the world religion, as, as at least the hub of that. Um, the stuff you're dealing with, the UFOs, the ETs, this is unbelievable stuff. This is so important. Bible prophecy is not uh, just centered on the Middle East and what I'm talking about here on Psalm 83. Everything is state set right now. There's sure. no weapon that hasn't I been agree. fashioned, no yep. relationship that hasn't been formed, or no technology that hasn't been developed. It's all right in front of us. <clears throat> but I think the thing that's going to start to trigger it is the Middle East. I think the spotlight is going to go agree. front and center on I the agree. Middle East. It's it's too it's a cauldron right now, and the first missile that flies could be the very thing that opens Pandora's prophecy box here, and so we you know the world needs to be ready for a big different world coming real soon. If these wars of epic biblical proportion happen soon and sequentially, and we're talking about Psalm eighty three and peripheral prophecies about destruction of Damascus and the destructions that go on and desolations in Egypt and things like that. Um, that will adversely affect the world, and that will adversely affect America, whose economy is struggling. It's about to collapse. It's it's all you know. If they shut the shut the Strait of Hormuz and the oil prices go up, sure, and sure. terrorist cells start uh, right. lifting up their ugly heads in America. <clears throat> there's a reason the Department of Homeland Security has procured over one point six billion rounds of ammunition and a bunch Isn't of new armored tanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's think tanks that are sitting there going, what if this happens, what if this happens, what if that happens, et cetera, right? Um, no, it's it's a very troubling time. And, and so in my closing words to your listeners, and you agree with me on this, we always close this way, L.A., is that you know, we have to have a hope in these troubling times, and they're going to get worse. And that hope is only in one place. It's not not money. That God of money in America has left. It's not Allah. That He's going nuts over there in the Middle East. He's a false God. Right. It's Jesus Christ. It's it's the one who's giving us this Bible prophecy. We're told in Revelation 19.10 that the, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of Bible prophecy. Isaiah 46.9 and 10 says that God, God declares the end from the beginning. There is God, God and there is no other uh, things that have not yet come. And it says his purposes will stand and he will accomplish all of his will. So that's what we got to focus on. Jesus Christ, the hope beyond the horizon here, he is the one who we can have a relationship, who will give us the peace inside of a storm. Uh, I personally believe he's going to come and take his church out in a pre-trib rapture uh, so that we can escape all these things. It says, watch therefore and pray always that you can escape all these things are going to come. That's in Luke 21, 36. It's Jesus Christ, folks. I mean, that's the bottom line. And if you don't know him right now, um, now, now is the time. Today is the day of your salvation. You need to put your focus on him and inquire diligently about him. Uh, L.A. and I are talking about things that are stage setting right now. Where did we get it? We got it from Jesus Christ in the Bible. Mm. You know, that's the bottom line. Be ready now, people, because we live at the end of the end times. And that's my parting to them. I just encourage them to uh, to know the Lord, to accept the Lord in their heart. Uh, Jesus Christ, it's, it's just a gift. Of, it says in Ephesians 2, 8, it says, We are saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 10 says, If you confess Jesus with your lips and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. We celebrated that he is risen on Easter this past Sunday. It's the real deal, folks. And uh, L.A., he's preaching the same message. So uh, what an honor to be on your program, L.A., and, and to no, be able to deliver have this you, message. Bill. Just fantastic. And uh, congratulations on your success with the book. Long time coming. I rejoice in your success and uh, look forward to meeting you, seeing you again, meeting you, seeing you again in uh, New York. We'll be up at a prophecy conference. Tell us about that real quick before we sign off. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to New York together, L.A. and I, and it's on April 2nd. It's uh, you can go to my website. It's probably on LA's too under upcoming events. It's the, I think it's called the Southern California Tiered Prophecy. Uh, yes, yes. Great Southern, no, not Southern California. Excuse me. The Great, yeah, great Southern, Southern Tier. Conference. <laughs> and uh, it's up in in New York, and we'd love to see as many people as we can there. Uh, LA and I are each going to speak for an hour two times, and uh, it's, we're going to cover so much prophecy, aren't we, LA? Yep, absolutely. And that's April 19th and 20th and the 21st. So um, it's going to be really good. It's going to be fun. 
I uh, look forward to seeing you there, L.A., and uh, we'll you a safe and blessed time until we meet again. Yep, you too, Bill. Great to have you on the show. Thank you so much, folks. That's all the time we have for our very special guest tonight, and with an honor to have him, Bill Salas, talking about his new book, Psalm 83. Go check that out, and also his website, Prophecy Depot, Prophecy Depot prophecydepot.com and uh, that's all the time we have for tonight folks you're listening to Acceleration Radio I'm your intrepid host L.A. Marzulli we'll be seeing you uh, here again next week and I think next week we've got let me just check real quick here uh, yes, Crit Putnam will be on uh, April 11th, we'll be talking about Exo Vaticana and of course Petros Romanus your questions will be welcome to answer to Chris again, Acceleration Radio thanks for listening folks, and remember I'll see you either on the air or in the air, Good night, everybody